Hi, today we are talking to Dr. Timothy Lau, a distinguished teacher for the Faculty of Medicine and the Director of Undergraduate Education for the Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ottawa. As well, he is the head of the Geriatric Psychiatry Inpatient Unit at the Royal Ottawa Hospital and also the chair of the National Group of Undergraduate Directors for Psychiatry for the 17 Canadian medical schools. Dr. Lau has become well known for his presentation entitled Happiness, 10 Things I Have Learned From My Patients. Thanks for joining me today, Dr. Lau. My pleasure. Thank you. So you're really getting to be known as the happiness doctor, and I think it's great that you're here and we can really find out what happiness is all about. So that's the first question I'd like to ask you is what is happiness? Well, thank you for inviting me. I, uh, I'm happy to be known as the happiness doctor. Uh, I think the, the Latin word for doctor means teacher. And one of the things I very much love sharing is the collective wisdom of the patients that I've taken care of over the years. And uh, many things that they have told me, I've incorporated into elements of these talks. And of the hundreds of talks I give, I find the happiness, uh, the theme of happiness is my favorite because it's potentially life-changing and, uh, and empowering. So you asked, well, what is happiness or mm -hmm. how do we define it? I would say that happiness is a fuzzy concept. Um, it's hard to define. It's hard to measure despite what economists say and it's hard to achieve despite what some psychologists might say. I think the modern sense of happiness though um, is, uh, is largely subjective. Okay. I think we, um, if you look at the English word, the old English word hap, uh, it's the origins for happiness uh, are, can be thought of as a type of chance. Okay. So it's found in words like happenstance. So in this view, happiness is something that happens to you by chance. So uh, we can become happy if we're fortunate or if lady luck visits us. The, the ancient view of happiness is different. The Aristotle, um, his word for happiness is eudaimonia, which uh, refers more to an objective state. So a life of uh, virtue in accordance with reason, or a life of excellence. So in this sense, um, happiness involves choices you make in your life and, uh, and virtue. Okay. So. I think the, the modern sense is, is more passive and the ancient view is more active. The modern view is more subjective and the ancient view is more objective. Okay. I think the reality though is happiness is both subjective and objective. Um, I think the, the sense of, of circumstances determining your happiness, which is what I think a lot of people expect. They, they think that if only something were to happen, they would become happy. Uh, doesn't lead to happiness because the goalposts keep moving. Sure. Know, so think. like money, for example, like mm -hmm. is money going to make me happy if I win the lottery? Am I going to be happy? That's right. So. so people are thinking if only something, if only they win a lottery or if only they get this promotion or if only somebody says one thing to them in a certain way, they'll be happy. But once these things end up happening, people invariably feel empty. What research has shown is that only 10% of our happiness is derived from things external to us. So our circumstances only sort of budge the meter by a little bit. Far more important are, is, are the things that are internal to us, how we process things and the intentional choices we make. Okay, so then going on from there, and we, you also often hear that saying, money can't buy me happiness, but can money buy me happiness? Is that gonna make a difference for my ha levels of happiness? Well, along the lines of what I was saying about expecting things in your life to bring you happiness, those are, it's a type of circumstance. I think the modern view of happiness, if you ask somebody what their, their image of happiness is, it's usually this idea of someone winning a lottery. Right, yeah. And suddenly they're going to be happy. Yeah, I know I've, there's a guy in our office, every time the lottery gets really big, he's buying his tickets, <laughs> otherwise he doesn't bother, but yeah. So the, the unfortunate thing is that um, people who win lotteries, you know, a year later, they are often not happy. Mm -hmm. And I think for all of us, we've had that experience of wanting something and then thinking that's going to make us happy and then finding it doesn't do that. Right. As far as money, it is a cliche to say that money can't buy you happiness. But I think it's, it's obvious that 
our basic needs uh, are important determinants of happiness. You know, as Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right. it's important to have some basic needs met. When I gave this talk to the people that run the shelters uh, and subsidized housing in Ottawa, um, one of the workers said, you know, it's hard for their clients to be happy when they don't have a safe, warm place to live. Right. So you can see that that is a, a, an impediment. It's not, it doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it harder. Right. Um, as far as uh, money and, and buying us happiness beyond our basic needs, um, the Princeton uh, economist, uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, who won the Nobel, Peace, Nobel Economics Prize in 2002, um, did, a, did surveys in 2008 and 2009 of about a half million people and found that um, the, the perfect um, salary for happiness is 75000 or above. It okay. actually tends to plateau out at 75000 okay. And in this, they looked at subjective happiness or moment-to-moment -moment happiness as opposed to objective happiness or life satisfaction. So as you had more money, you, your life satisfaction might increase. And I think largely it's because it's kind of looking back at your life and your accomplishments right. and seeing if you've, if you've done stuff. But the moment-to-moment -moment happiness, I think, is largely subjective. And above 75000 it doesn't seem to increase incrementally with increases in your salary. Okay, so we could, like, tell our politicians that we all have to make at least 75000 then we could have a happy country, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so just on that idea of life fulfillment, and I've been reading some other books, too, about personal integrity and that being wrapped up with happiness as well. Do you, can you comment on that and how that kind of fits into the idea of happiness? Sure. Um, I w just wanted to say one thing sure, about yep. the, the, the money. There was a study that was published in Science in 2008, and the question was, can money buy you happiness? And the answer was, well, it depends on how you spend it. Okay. And um, what they found in the study is depend they had two groups. One group spent money on themselves, and the other group spent money on other people. So regardless of the amount of money that they spent, the people that spent money on other people were happier at the end of the okay. study. So it is possible to to become happier with money, but the problem is you have to give it away. Okay. Okay, so Christmas is a great time <laughs> for all us parents to be happy as we're <laughs> spending money on our kids. Okay, so th that's a good point. Um, so you were asking about yes, personal, personal integrity. Yes, personal integrity, yes. Let's go on to that. Well, uh, Gandhi once said that in... Uh, happiness is you, when you, when what you say, what you, what, what you think, and what you do are in harmony. Okay. So, I think that it's important for us to have integrity and to, and to live a life that um, that has virtue or has excellence. So, people often say, "Well, I'm not sure what it means to live a good life," and I think we can learn a lot from the Greeks. Okay. Who, People like Aristotle, uh, Plato, the, uh, the Stoics, they talked about the importance of uh, inudaimonia, of, of virtue. Um, even the father of modern hedonism, Epicurus, talked about how the life of pleasure is actually a life of virtue. Okay. I don't think the modern hedonists really subscribe okay. to that, but Epicurus did. Okay. So uh, the, the sense is that a good life is a life of fairness, um, self-control, um, courage, and uh, and wisdom. Okay. And I think all other uh, Plato also uh, in Socrates included piety as a fifth virtue, but Plato's Republic, you know, the four mm -hmm. different yes. ca um, yeah. cases in, in the pub Republic, see these virtues uh, as being um, hinge virtues or things that everything depends on. Okay. So, um, patience is, you know, is type, a type of self-control. Right. Or, um, or compassion, at least humanly understood, is, is a type of fairness to, to other people, respecting another person's dignity. Okay. So really what you're saying that if we want to have a full life, we really need to um, live virtue. Yes. I, th I think it's a matter of... You know, it, if you aim just towards the subjective of how you feel, um, that aim is uh, often um, um, is not achieved. Okay. Yeah. I think that's uh, one of the mysteries about happiness is the more we aim for it, the harder it, we actually, it, it is to actually achieve. Right. 
And the definition of it is, is quite hard to, uh, you see why it's hard to define. Right. Because happiness uh, as a subjective state is, I think if you look at the, in the dictionary, what the definition of happiness is, it's, um, if you look at the actual definition, it's usually something like a subjective or emotional state of well-being with positive emotions varying from contentment to joy. Okay. But the problem with that is that it's largely subjective. It doesn't take into account objective reality. So you could be um, you could be in North Korea and have no access to any sort of freedom, um, but you you have this beloved leader and you you have nationalistic pride, um, and he could even you know take some sort of there could be a form of worship of this person, or you right. could be brainwashed in some dungeon somewhere and love your captor. Mm -hmm. So the subjective sense of happiness is is not true happiness. You need a connection with objective reality. Okay. And that's where virtue comes in too, is that it, it's not just how you feel, it's also what you do. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you very much. We're going to wrap it up with that. And um, what we're going to do in our next two interviews with Dr. Lau is look at some of the lessons he's learned from his patients, talk to them in more in depth. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to like this video if you do, or share it on any of your social media accounts. I'm Nicole Scheidel, and you're watching a Fit Minds production. <laughs>